But wait, if he never made contact, then how could there possibly be a penalty? What's wrong here? Good morning to you. Good Wednesday morning. I'm Dan Kovacevic of DK Pittsburgh Sports, and this is Daily Shot of Penguins. It comes your way bright and early every weekday if you're into football and or baseball. I also offer daily shots of Steelers and Pirates in the same place that you found this. The Rangers beat the Hurricanes last night in overtime. 4-3, to three. Vince Trocek, Upper St. Clair's own, banged home a rebound through Freddie Anderson to win it. Jake Gensel had a couple of goals for Carolina. Really, really good hockey event at Madison Square Garden. Translated really, really well to television. Exactly the kind of thing that if you love this great game, and I've loved it my whole life, you're happy for the game. Except for Jacob Truba. And except for the way This league handles Truba because late in regulation, presuming you haven't seen this already and it's gone beyond viral, Truba took a run, and I mean a run, at Martin Natchez of the Hurricanes. Went multiple steps, and then as he got near Natchez by the glass, projected himself Superman style, completely horizontal, captured on video and multiple still photographs, completely horizontal, about four or five feet off the ground, is a hell of an athletic thing unto itself, with his left elbow protruded to go at Natchez's head. Now, how Natchez ducked this, it was Muhammad Ali-esque. There's either something that he sensed or saw at the last split second, but he showed his own athleticism in being able to just pull his head out of the way as he went under this flying attempt to injure him. That's what happened here. Truba went flying into this player for the purpose of injuring him. There is no other purpose to that sequence. There is no hockey purpose to that sequence. Truba threw himself into the air with such force and such speed, and by the way, such aerodynamics, that even though Netches ducked under it, he flung himself, Truba did, into the glass. It's a miracle he didn't hurt himself. Now, this being Truba, nothing was called. There is a soft spot for Truba at the NHL's offices, which, by the way, are in Manhattan, certainly with George Peros, the Washington, Pennsylvania native, who hilariously made his career as an enforcer in the league and then ended up becoming the one who meets out the discipline. And that goes all the way up to Bill Daly and Gary Bettman. They've got no problem with Truba. They see him as just an honest physical player in an era where there aren't a whole lot of those types left anymore. He's just a throwback. Good old-fashioned hockey player. And that goes double in the playoffs. And besides, nothing happened. Everything's okay. They both just got up and kept playing. There wasn't even any real contact between the two of them. Well, I've got a problem with this. And it goes beyond the usual Truba rants that I'm prone to have from time to time. I've got a problem with this specifically because I happen to have a copy of the NHL's rulebook. When you get to the section, well, I'm just going to read this to you. This is right out of their book. A match penalty shall be assessed to any player or team official who recklessly endangers or attempts to injure any opposing player or team official. The end. The key word in this is attempts, meaning You don't have to succeed. Picture this for a second. 
Let's say, remember Sean Avery, the nutcase who played for the Rangers and Kings and a bunch of other teams? And remember when Avery got that really bizarre misconduct penalty for just leaving basically the action to go stand in Martin Brodeur's crease, face him, and just yell stuff at him? It was bizarre behavior. And there really wasn't a rule that the officials could have called in the moment. So they actually had to figure out, what do we do here? What do we do? And they they created something on the fly that would prevent anybody from doing that again. Let's say that Avery, stay with me on this, just started skating around the rink and swinging his stick like helicopter style at people. He would do it over their heads. He'd miss their heads but he'd still be swinging his stick at their heads. And what if he did it once to somebody and they ducked under it? What would you call? You know what you'd call? That rule I just read. Attempts to injure any opposing player. Oh, another key word in that rule that shouldn't be ignored. A match penalty. Not a minor, not a major not a misconduct, a match penalty. That means, for anybody who doesn't know what that is, and you you wouldn't be blamed for it since the league doesn't use it nearly as often as it should, you're out instantly. The referee has the discretion to call either a five-minute match penalty or a 10-minute match penalty, and you're required to have a hearing toward a suspension. That's the rule that I read you. And it involves an attempt to injure. If you saw this sequence, I don't care if you're the most diehard, blue shirt, whatever. This has nothing to do with teams. It has a lot to do with a player. Nothing to do with teams. If you saw that and don't believe that it was intent to injure or an attempt to to injure, to be more exact with the wording and the rule, then I know a place where they're hiring for people just like you. NHL Department of Player Safety. When we come back, J1Q. Today's J1Q comes from Scott, who says, DK... We've been privileged to watch Sidney Crosby and Alexander Ovechkin for so long, but the time's going to come up for both of them to hang up the skates. Ovi seemed to show his age in the Capitals' first-round playoff exit, while Sid still seems pretty much like he's Sid. Of these two, who's going to retire first? I'm out of the predictions business, Scott. I say it all the time, and I mean it. I'm not going to be predicting one over the other. I will share with you some thoughts about where they are right now, though, and how they've gotten here. I'm surprised about something regarding each of them, and I'm a little bit embarrassed about one of these. I thought that Sid's style would wear down sooner than Ovi's. I really did. If you think about Sid's style of play, the nonstop grinding, spinning around, digging in the corners, winning possession, fighting behind the net, and all of his constant motion, 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 what we've seen from him since he was 18 years old here, it really hasn't changed. There are certain parts of his game, of course, that have grown, that have matured, but they've just been expansions on the repertoire. They haven't really been an alteration to the repertoire. I really thought that would have to go, you know? I thought he'd have to do something different because the greatest player that I've ever seen and that you'll ever see, also here in Pittsburgh, had to make his own adjustments in the second phase of his career. When Mario Lemieux emerged from retirement, he was not the same player. He wasn't flying up the rink trying to beat Raymond Bork or Neil Wilkinson or whoever, Mark Fortier jumping on his back, chasing him down the ice, whacking at him like uh, he was wielding a machete. 
that's not the Mario who came back. Mario came back. Yeah, he was still a playmaker, principally on the power play, but he was a gunner. And an unapologetic gunner at that. It's the transformation from being able to do everything to just becoming a pure shooter was startling to people. But it made perfect sense. Someone with a history of back trouble knew he wasn't going to be able to generate that same type of speed for a big man between the blue lines and just said, hey, I'm going to park myself over here to the left. I might even be at the most ridiculous angle, but get me the puck. I'll find a way to get it in. And he did. Sid has found new ways to score. He's never been better than he is now at tips, deflections, redirects, uh, even just poking in pucks from the side of the net. He's better at all of those things now. But he didn't change. If you watched him over this past season... Just a regular old shift. Him, Brian Rust, uh, Jake Gensel, of course, when he was here. That video could be matched against something from 2005. You know, you would just replace like his current wingers with Mark Recchi and Bill Guerin and Colby Armstrong or whatever. Whereas in Ovi's case, I thought to myself, well, you know, here's. Mario, gunner, Ovi, ultimate gunner in hockey history. This really ought to work out pretty well for Ovi, but it didn't. And I'm convinced without making any excuses for him that so much of that had to do with losing Nicholas Backstrom to that career ending injury. He's had players to pass him the puck since Backstrom's gone out, but no one anywhere close to Backstrom. It's mostly John Carlson, who's a point man, and it's coming across from the right point or center point, which isn't nearly as uh, dangerous and unpredictable as the way Backstrom used to find Ovi from anywhere on the rink, especially on the Washington power play. It just hasn't worked out. If teams want to take Ovi away, including on the power play, they can do it. You just take one guy and say, go stand in front of eight. It's not any fun, but this is what we need you to do today. And that wasn't the case when Backstrom was still playing. So which one? You figure that out. I appreciate the question. I appreciate everybody listening to Daily Shot of Penguins. We're going to do another one of these tomorrow. 